So I'm going to introduce uh, our keynote speaker this afternoon, Judge David Strauss. I'll give a brief bio, turn it over to him, and he's promised to leave some time at the end for audience Q&A. Judge Strauss received his bachelor's degree of art with highest distinction in 1995 and his master of business administration in 1999 from the University of Kansas. He also received his law degree from the University of Kansas Law School the same year, where he served as editor-in-chief of the criminal procedure edition of the Kansas Law Review. Following law school, Judge Strauss clerked for Judge Melvin Brunetti of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Judge J. Michael Ludig of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He practiced for a time in white-collar criminal and appellate litigation in the Washington, D.C. office of Sidley, Austin, Brown, and Wood. Following his time in private practice, he clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas of the United States Supreme Court. Prior to joining the bench, Judge Strauss was a member of the faculty at the University of Minnesota Law School. From 20, uh, 2004 until 2010, he taught and wrote in the areas of federal courts and jurisdiction constitutional law, criminal law, and politics. From 2010 to 2018, he was an Associate Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. And on January 31st, 2018, he became a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. The title of Judge Strauss's speech this afternoon is What My Grandparents' Experiences in the Holocaust Taught Me About the First Amendment. So please join me in welcoming Judge David Strauss. Well, um, thanks, Matt, and thanks to the thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting me. Um, I think we we're supposed to do this a couple of years ago and weren't able to do it, and so I was um, so gratified when the invitation went out and, and, and I was able to come back and fulfill my obligation to the Wisconsin uh, State Chapter. Um, this is a heavy talk. Um, when you're talking about the Holocaust, it, it hits, for me, it hits pretty close to home. In fact, I was saying that it hits so close to home that I had to take a hiatus from giving this speech for about six months because uh, I just, it, it it's a tough speech to give. So, um, so I'm back doing it. It's the first time in six months I've given it. Um, and I think this occasion is as good as, good as any. So as the title suggests, my grandparents on my father's side were Holocaust survivors. I'm fortunate that I have their personal records. It tells the story of their lives, from their hardships to their liberation to their life after liberation. Their stories and example have shaped me in many ways, perhaps even in ways that today, standing before you, having spent time on this, I can't appreciate. I've co come to realize their stories have done more than just affect me personally. They have become part of who I am and how I view the world around me. To a certain extent, they've also shaped my judging too and why I hold so firmly to my first principles, those core beliefs that shape how I approach the law. One example is the First Amendment, and in particular, its part in guaranteeing a free society. Years before I ever studied the freedom of speech or the free exercise of religion in law school, I learned about these principles, at least abstractly, from my grandparents. My grandparents, Walter and Malvina Strauss, were lucky to survive. They met for the first time in a liberation camp in Germany and were married soon thereafter. Although they originally planned to move to Israel, they ultimately decided to settle in Kansas City. My grandmother, born Malvina Nyman, grew up in Hungary as one of seven children. Her family was devout. She spoke fondly of the rich traditions of the Jewish faith that were part of her early life, including speaking Yiddish around the home. Her relatively peaceful childhood, however, was violently torn apart at age 18, when Nazi soldiers dragged my grandmother and her family from their home. At gunpoint, they were forced to walk all day to a cattle train, which transported them to Auschwitz. Of her family, most of whom I never knew, only three of her sisters survived. Although fortunate that she did not perish too, my grandmother suffered unspeakable harms that left her reluctant to share her experiences. Loss of family members, 
vicious beatings that led to permanent blindness in one eye, and verbal attacks. She was frequently called a damn Jew. All contributed to lifelong depression and a hesitancy to speak about her time in the concentration camps. Despite spending the better part of several summers with her as a child, I cannot say that I ever really knew anything about my grandmother other than her post-Holocaust life. My grandfather was different. He shared his thoughts on life and the Holocaust in particular with anyone who would listen, not just me. For that reason, I will focus most of my attention during the remainder of the speech discussing my grandfather's experiences and the impact um, of what he, his impact on me. My grandfather, Walter Strauss, was young when he was shipped off to the camps. Born in 1924, he was first sent to a labor camp and then to Auschwitz in 1943, around the age of 19. He was one of two few to survive. He passed away in 1995, after I had known him for only two decades. But the lessons from his life shaped me to this very day. I did not fully realize his impact or truly understand his suffering until many years after his death. In a way, this journey into his life is my way of honoring him. My first memories of my grandfather were from a young age. I grew up knowing him as a survivor, watching how he lived his life after liberation. By the time I came into the world, he was already afflicted with multiple sclerosis, a disease that took away his ability to walk, to write, and to take care of himself. Despite all that he had seen and endured, however, he was a great and giving man that never complained. Rather than turning inward, he turned towards others in his life. He made a lasting impression on everyone he met particularly in his efforts to reach out to and work on behalf of other survivors. He once said, and I'm quoting, encouraging words have made it possible for me, for me to speak. For the ones who did not survive, the ones who died after their liberation, and the ones who are unable to speak for themselves. For him, telling a story was never easy. Despite liberation in 1945, it was not until the mid-1970s that my grandfather was able to speak to us about his experiences. Speaking in 1979, he observed, only in the past three or four years have I been able to get the courage to speak up. For many years, the feeling that you were not allowed to speak during imprisonment stayed with me. And I'm sure many other survivors share that feeling. We are crippled emotionally as a result of what we had to go through. We will, we try, and we must keep on fighting even though it is so difficult to do. It is of course no exaggeration to say that those in prison in Nazi Germany were not allowed to speak. Yet even years before his imprisonment, my grandfather and others like him were forced to wear a yellow Mogan David, the star with the name Jude on it. The Nazis restricted where he could travel and censored his mail. He could not send anything to foreign countries, and the government read everything arriving from the outside. One time, after intercepting my grandfather's mail, the Gestapo questioned him. He recalled that he was happy that he got out alive from the Gestapo building, because the Gestapo was tremendously harsh on anybody. It didn't have to be a Jew. Anyone who was opposed to the Nazi regime would be punished. It is fair to say that even before he actually became a prisoner, my grandfather and others like him were effectively prisoners in their own country, stripped of their right to speak. Once he arrived at the camp, things only got worse. Prisoners were forced to remove all their clothing, sit as barbers sheared their hair, and watch as numbers were tattooed on their forearms. Then the guards made them work. My grandfather recalled the following incident. When marching, all of a sudden, I saw one guard step close to a prisoner, pull his cap from his head, and throw it about 20 feet away. The prisoner, who had to have a cap on at all times, jumped out of line to retrieve it. A gunshot followed. The prisoner, prisoner was killed. What for? Because he had stepped out of line. 
because this guard was a barbarian who did not care if he shot one or if he shot ten. It was right for him to kill. It was right for him to destroy other human beings. Despite witnessing and experiencing some of the cruelest acts imaginable during his time at Auschwitz, my grandfather continued to see the best in people, not the worst. In fact, he thought that decency and compassion could be found in even the most horrific conditions. He relayed stories about the repeated acts of kindness that spared his life, acts committed by fellow prisoners in the concentration camps, by those who had nothing to gain and absolutely everything to lose. One particularly, particularly moving story involved the nurses in the camp hospital, which was a cruelly ironic description because many who visited the hospital never made it out alive. Its purpose was to separate the weak from the strong and to make sure that only the strong returned to work. As one might expect, my grandfather became frail during his time in the concentration camps. The camp's policy was that no so-called patient was worth keeping around longer than two weeks. The prisoner nurses knew that he could not recover so quickly, which meant certain death for him. So they risked their own lives to save him by moving him from room to room and falsifying hospital records. These acts of kindness, which came at great risk, spared my grandfather's life. He recalled the story in his own words. After about two weeks, I was told all of a sudden, you're going to be released today, even though you are still too sick. But don't worry, you will be released just on paper. You will not leave the hospital. I will try to keep you as long as possible until you are well again. I was moved to a different room. I did not understand why at the time, but I was told just keep quiet. In another example of humanity, in the midst of darkness, he told the story of three of his fellow prisoners, three dear friends who attempted an escape from Auschwitz. My grandfather assisted in their plan, which also included another prisoner, the camp electrician. The plan was to have the prisoner electrician short out the portion of the electric fence surrounding their portion of the camp, and in that moment, his friends would escape. My grandfather, who provided them with stolen civilian clothes to wear after escaping, was privy to the plan because he was invited to escape with them. However, as someone who did not speak Polish, my grandfather knew that he would be unable to escape detection outside the fences. So he stayed behind as his three dear friends carried out their plan. In a cruel act of betrayal, the prisoner electrician revealed the plan to the guards, not knowing of my grandfather's role. When his friends were caught and hanged as punishment, they could have admitted my grandfather's involvement. Instead, they kept it secret. As my grandfather watched his friends pay the ultimate price, my grandfather never forgot their deep loyalty, which had saved him. To put the rest in my grandfather's words, on a Sunday afternoon, my three friends were hanged on the gallows, erected in the middle of camp, a place where every morning thousands of prisoners stand, stood at attention for roll call prior to going to work. As part of my work, I took my dear friends down from the gallows, knowing that they had not betrayed me. They had kept their word, and I had survived. Deprived of his ability to speak during his formative years, my grandfather made it his life's mission to share his story. The difficult and sometimes painful lessons that it conveyed were part of why it was so important for other people to hear it. As I grew up, I realized that my grandfather was someone who had strong beliefs and would not back down in the face of adversity. As my colleagues will tell you, past and present, he passed that trait on to me. One example, a uh, little lighter example comes from my Supreme Court clerkship. When I happened to disagree with a position taken by Justice Thomas, didn't happen very often, but it occasionally did. I cannot say which case or even what the case was about because I continue to owe a duty of confidentiality to the court. But what I can say is that I spent more than 30 minutes trying to respectfully persuade Justice Thomas to think about an issue differently. Now I want you to think about that. 
I had just turned 28 years old, four years removed from law school, and I was telling a then 11-year veteran of the United States Supreme Court to reconsider his views. As those who know Justice Thomas might suspect, I did not persuade him. In fact, he told me at the conclusion of the discussion that I had convinced him that his own original views were correct, <laughs> not what I had in mind. But you know what? Advocating for my beliefs was the right thing to do. Why? Because Justice Thomas taught me a lesson that day by listening very carefully to what I had to say and what I believed and, to, and appreciated the fact that I stood up for my beliefs, even though he was already firmly set in his own. This, echo, this lesson echoed something I had heard and learned from my grandfather years before. Defending your beliefs, no matter how unpopular they may be, is always the right thing to do. There was another lesson in that experience, too. Justice Thomas listened to me. He listened carefully to me. My grandfather also taught me the same lesson. As important as it is to defend your own beliefs, it is equally important to listen closely to what others have to say. These lessons still stick with me to this very day, and they inform my understanding of what the freedom of speech means. The Supreme Court, this is black letter law, has long held that the First Amendment protects the right to receive information and ideas. The Nazi regime, of course, was fundamentally opposed to any ideas except those they endorsed. It restricted speech in every way possible, from compelling Jews to wear the yellow Mogan David on their clothes, to punishing citizens for saying anything critical of the government. Even the mere threat of non-conforming speech was enough, or else my grandfather would not have had to answer for a simple act of sending mail. It is nothing short of remarkable that after the widespread and systematic suppression that my grandfather experienced, he became, he became such an avid and curious listener. Once he came to America, my grandfather sought out the community of other Holocaust survivors. Among his greatest accomplishments was working on behalf of those other survivors, including successfully obtaining financial assistance from the German government and speaking in memorial events to remind survivors that their voices mattered. Perhaps most importantly, he constantly remi reminded fellow survivors how important it was to be proud of being Jewish. His stories remind me that my own Jewish heritage and faith are an integral part of who I am. And fortunate for, fortunately for me, the country I had the privilege of growing up in is one that has protected the exercise of my Jewish faith, again, by virtue of the First Amendment. I feel blessed that I, unlike my grandparents, have never had to choose between my life and my religion. Perhaps it is no accident that my grandparents ended up here. America has always been a religious refuge. From the er early settlers onward, onward, people have come here to escape religious persecution. The Constitution reflects this tradition. Consider what the First Amendment tells us about what it means to be an individual. Unlike what my grandparents experienced in Nazi Germany, Germany, no one in this country is a number with or without a tattoo. Our values may be different, our beliefs may be worlds apart, and still the government has no right to tell us what to believe or what to say. Importantly, we are allowed but we are not forced to wear those beliefs on our sleeves. We can speak about them, we can pray about them, and we can even associate with others who have the same beliefs. Again, all under the umbrella of the First Amendment. These ideas could not be more fundamentally at odds with how the Nazis treated my grandparents. During their time in the concentration camps, their cap captors made every effort to escape every shred of their humanity. They tattooed numbers on their arms and took away their names, their belongings, and even their clothes. They were told that they were Jews and nothing more, yet they weren't allowed to act like one. Luckily for my grandfather, he was able to maintain his own sense of identity despite the best efforts of his captors. He always remembered the importance of maintaining connections to community, identity, 
and religion. Even through my grandfather's most difficult days, he never forgot who he was or the community to which he belonged. So what does any of this have to do with judging or the law? The reason, the reason why we're here today. To start, his experiences remind me about the wisdom of our own constitution, from setting out our enumerated rights to protecting them through the separation of powers, with each branch of government serving as a check on the others. It also brings into sharp focus the importance of the rule of law in our society. In large part, the evils of the Holocaust were a result of the personal views of just a few powerful individuals who were able to use the law and the legal system to their own ends. It was instructive, though ordinarily, extraordinarily difficult, when in high school I decided to do a book report on Mein Kampf, which is the book that was penned, about eight, penned by Adolf Hitler. My goal was to better understand my family, my history, and what motivated the Holocaust. It was in reading that book that I realized how a single person or a single movement, if left unchecked or unaccountable, can pervert the rule of law. If those in power can lead with their own sense of what is right and what is wrong, without any constraints, including the rule of law, then our most important institutions can become co-opted and vital safeguards can be eliminated. The danger is never too far away, and we always have to be vigilant about making sure our freedoms are not whittled away. One case from my time on the Minnesota Supreme Court stands out. In a case called State versus Crowley, the question was whether the state could criminalize the making of knowingly false statements about police misconduct made to other police officers. That's a mouthful. The law may sound innocent enough, but I noted in my dissent that it came very close to prohibiting the very type of speech that is at the very heart of the First Amendment, speech critical of the government. And it did so by attaching a criminal sanction, likely deterring any citizen from making any complaints about police misconduct, true or otherwise. First Amendment doctrine calls this a chilling effect. Of course, lingering in the back of my mind was a single fact that the Nazi regime had made it a point of defining truth and falsehood too, leaving few in Nazi Germany willing to speak. Another case that comes to mind is a case called Telescope Media versus Lucero, which involved a couple who produced wedding videos through a family-owned business. They wanted their videos to promote a certain message celebrating marriage as a sacrificial covenant between one man and one woman. For that reason, the couple was unwilling to produce wedding videos that depicted same-sex weddings. The problem for them was a Minnesota anti-discrimination statute that said if they wanted to produce any wedding videos, videos at all, they had to provide them to everybody, regardless of the message they were trying to express. On behalf of the court, I authored the majority opinion holding that the message that they were trying to express through their videos was protected First Amendment expression, no matter how unpopular their views may appear to others. Minnesota's law, in turn, was a form of compelled speech because it required the couple to speak favorably about same-sex marriage once they made the decision to speak favorably about opposite-sex marriage. Here's the point. The point is that if we decide that government can prohibit offensive speech, speech is not really free anymore. It would surprise no one that I would have been personally offended by the decision by the Supreme Court in the 1970s to allow neo-Nazis to march through a Chicago suburb filled with Jewish residents. But that's not the point. As the Supreme Court put it, the bedrock principle of free speech is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society itself finds the idea offensive or disagreeable. I am worried that this foundational principle sometimes gets lost today. It is also a right that we enjoy. This is not a right that either one of my grandparents had. As my grandfather said of his experience at Auschwitz, I saw then what concentration camps meant, the destruction of the human being, of his dignity, of his self-esteem, of his confidence, of his beliefs in God, of his beliefs in, fe in the fellow man. 
wrapping up, this is always the hardest part of the speech for me, in wrapping up, I want to let my grandfather's words again speak for themselves. As my grandfather told a group in Kansas City on April 22, 1979, I'm sitting before you in my wheelchair, the lifeline for my daily independence. Disabled from the after effects of malnutrition and mental stress during the times I was a slave laborer and prisoner in labor at the concentration camps. I sit here before you with extreme physical and emotional pain. With all my handicaps, I'm humble and thankful that I'm able to be here and represents, represent the ones who cannot be here. You who came here because you do care about your fellow man should listen. Spread my words around. The people who are not here should know that there is a spokesman who knows what it, may, what it means to survive, who cannot forget his sufferings, and who knows the sufferings of the survivors who cannot speak for themselves. I was transported in a freight car, unknowing my destination to Auschwitz. I was then taken to an open truck to Auschwitz Buna, the IG Farben chemical complex, which is part of the camp. I remember being stripped naked of civilian cloth running through a cold April rain. I remember shivering not only from the cold, but also from the fear of what would happen next. A prisoner tattooing the number 117022 on my forearm. Suddenly I didn't have a name anymore. I was just a number. But even with no name, I still knew who I was. I still had my identity. I still knew my upbringing, my roots. I was so young, a teenager. Already in my young years, I had experienced a life that most people never experience in a lifetime, much less survive. At that time, I could not comprehend that I would die. I probably didn't even understand what death meant because I was so young. I had not lived enough. I had just survived. Liberation. What did it mean to us? You try to find members of your family, but you know they're not coming back. You immigrate to new and other countries, new surroundings, new language, new customs. You find a job. You work hard to support yourself and your new family. You get accustomed to your new country, a free human being finally. Suddenly, your thoughts come back to a time when you were subjected to inhumane treatment. The joy of liberation and freedom somehow gets lost with your own inner feelings. Something is wrong with me. You question yourself, why did I survive? Why? All of a sudden, life is a struggle again. Who can you complain to? Maybe no one wants to believe that we are suffering from the after effects of the Holocaust. Some people believe us, but not the ones who are responsible for it. Right now, we are still fighting for the damage done to us, for our rights. I am speaking the facts and the truth for many survivors. We, the survivors, have to let the world know that we will never again allow another Holocaust. All of you here in this room, may I call you my friends, we must speak up and let the world know that we are proud of our heritage. These words encapsulate my grandfather's spirit. Not only because he, he, he survived the most unspeakable of tragedies, but because of who he became and what he taught me. It is important not only that we remember those words, never again, but that we never forget what people like my grandparents endured and the lessons we can learn from them. I can say this, Grandpa, I remember and I will never forget. I think we still have some time for questions. Uh, if anyone has any, I'm happy to answer them. All right, one in the back of the room. Brave soul. Where in America did your grandparents move to, and did they have family here, or were they uh, on their own? So um, this is a funny, not, not a funny ha-ha story, but a funny story in the in the sense that you, you, it's a small world. So. They moved to Kansas City at the, um, with the support of a um, prominent Jewish uh, per, uh, family, the, the Brand family, and in particular Hyman Brand, who sponsored them coming over and living in the Kansas City area. They knew nobody. 
Uh, my grandmother's sister, one of them ended up in Florida, one of them ended up in New York, so they were all separated. Um, they couldn't sort of be in the same place and, and survive. Um, but in the, in the funny part of it, um, my brother was set up for a blind date um, because of one of my mom's sorority sister, a sorority sister was about 10 years ago. And it turned out he married her, and the woman he married was the granddaughter of Hyman Brand, who sponsored uh, my grandparents to come over. So it's just a small world. And they didn't know it when they were set up together. It came up sort of later down the line. But they came over here with really nothing and built a life. Other questions? Yep. Jordan. Excellent talk. So the, the Supreme Court uh, completed uh, their oral arguments this week, and you clerked up there. And just like the last two months, the May and June, can you just paint a picture, like what's the life of a clerk like and like what they're doing? And, and you know, do you get any sleep, you know, things like that? <laughs> yeah, I will say, and this wasn't because of Justice Thomas. This was because of my own work habits. There were, there, I did pull a couple of all-nighters uh, during the last couple of months uh, when you're at the court. They're trying, you know, they have this hard deadline, um, which has become a little less of a hard deadline under Chief Justice Roberts of trying to get everything out by the end of June. I think they extended it a couple times into the first week of July over the past couple of years. But it is a, uh, yeah, it is a tough, I mean, it's, it's really exciting to be there and I loved every minute of it. Um, but you have to catch up on your sleep after you finish, um, not while you're doing it. Um, there are so many, you know, usually by this time, and this, this term is no exception, there's, you know, half the cases needed, almost half the cases need to get out. Um, and that just requires a lot of, a lot of, you know, pushing the paper and getting it done. Um, so it's, it's, it was the best experience of my life. I cannot recommend clerking more. Um, Justice Thomas remains a very close, dear friend. Um, but it is, it is, it is also, you, you work hard at the, at the job as well. But exciting, yep. I had no idea. Did this happen today? Uh, it was just, it was announced yesterday. Wow. Today, Senator Mar uh, Marco Rubio is uh, sounding the alarm on it. He issued a warning to Americans after Homeland Security Secretary, um, how do you say that, Ma Mayorkas, announced that his agency has established a body to combat hmm. misinformation ahead of the 22 midterm elections. Wow. Well, I got to be careful about what I say, but but obviously, I think that the my speech, you know, covers a lot of that, and um, I'll just leave it at that. But that's very interesting. Um, yeah, and I was on a plane. We were just talking about that. I was on a plane for my flight was supposed to take up four o'clock, and I think I was on a plane for about three and a half hours. So that might have that might have hit the news while I was sitting on the tarmac. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Judge, did your grandparents' experience influence your decision to become a lawyer? I think so. Um, so when people ask me why I became a lawyer, um, I have a, a pretty stock answer, at least I used to have a stock answer. So if you read about me, you'll see this stock answer in the news, which is I used to watch old um, Perry Mason episodes, and I love the fact that he could always get the guy to confess or gal to confess on the stand, which of course we don't, we know doesn't really happen in real life all that often. Um, but deep down, when I started investigating what, and this is really in the last eight or nine years, I started you know, working with my grandparents' papers. And my grandfather has an oral history that's like 120 pages that was transcribed by someone, a professor. Um, and there's a lot of documents. I think I realized that, that my grandparents actually had a profound impact and the injustice they went through and their, the fact that they didn't have rights had a profound impact on why I became a lawyer, even though I, I don't think I knew that at the time, and I probably didn't know it until well into my judicial career. Anything else? Yep, one more. Yeah, so they met in a liberation camp. Um, I think they were, I don't know if they were in the same camps at the same time. I have a, I have a little chart at home that shows exactly where they were. Um, they both spent some time in the same camps, but maybe not at the same time. I don't know if there was much overlap. So they met in a liberation camp and, and fell in love. I mean, what's, what's amazing about it is, you know, 
when I think about my grandmother, she was in many ways broken uh, after that experience. And uh, my grandfather, I think, was broken for a long time after, um, after he came back. It was only until the 1970s that, that he really started becoming comfortable talking about what he went through. Um, and the fact that they were able to find each other, you're exactly right, in, in, in such a terrible, um, terrible circumstance is, is amazing. And I often say, I mean, some people, uh, you know, say, say prayers for a certain thing, but one of the prayers I often think about is, um, you know, but for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here, right? Because most of my family is, is perished in the Holocaust. I mean, there's, I, there are people, I don't even know their names. Um, and my, my aunt who does a lot of the genealogy, that she doesn't know their names. It just is cut off because these people perished. Um, you know, these family members perished. And so I feel very fortunate and, and it's one of the re things that drives me on a daily basis is the fact that I feel like in many ways they suffered so that I could have the life that I have. And so I have to do a lot to, to live up. It's a lot to live up to, let's put it that way. But it is, it is a wonderful, beautiful story despite what they had to go through. Anything else? Well, there are no other questions. All right.